so we're very delighted that you're here today. Thanks, Keith. You are currently immersed at the moment in a galaxy far, far away <laughs> with uh, series one of Andor, which is... Um, just been launched on uh, the Walt Disney has, Channel. Yep, the first four episodes have dropped already. And you're also uh, working on uh, series two of, of Andor, so we're very lucky to, lucky to have you. So we're going to do a sort of a, a kind of a rewind um, and just learn a bit more about really how you, well, how you, how, why are you sitting here today talking to me? <laughs> and that incredible journey that you've had so, so far. Uh -huh. And just kind of go back to the beginning. Well, you were... You were born in, in Australia, in, in, in Sydney. I was, in a galaxy far, far away, <laughs> in Sydney, Australia, <laughs> on the other side of the world. Uh, yes, I grew up there. I lived there until I was 30. Um, so I must say, growing up in the 70s and 80s in, in Sydney, was, it, was, it was a very liberal and sort of, I guess we say now, simpler times. It was a liberal and quite liberating place, I think. I always feel that I wasn't necessarily weighed down with um, histories or tradition. It just kind of felt like, you know, anything's possible, sky's the limit. And I think that's maybe a quality that um, permeate, permeates a lot of the work of lots of uh, Australian artists, no matter what field they, they work in. There's a sort of, often a sense of, of freedom, um, and um, that's, I hope, the case in my work. When you were sort of growing up as a sort of young adult, did you, uh, did you go to the theatre? Did you go to the cinema? Did you wow. read comic books? <laughs> I you know, I didn't read comic books, full disclosure. Um, <laughs> that doesn't make me a bad costume designer. But I, I, was, I was deeply into classical music, in fact. Uh, and so uh, at, through high school, I played an instrument and I sang. And that was actually the way I came into the world of um, theatre. Uh, and design. Uh, we, my school had a special arrangement with the Sydney Opera House and uh, they would supply like uh, children choruses for you know when they needed um, you know young uh, singers in Tosca or De Rosen Cavalier or whatever it was they would s supply singers and so I was chosen in 1982 to be a, fa a blue fairy in Midsummer Night's Dream uh, <laughs> and so that was such a mind-blowing experience for me because I hadn't even thought about, about storytelling, about how, why, why theatre design, the creative process at all. And so here I was, a 12-year-old, covered in blue body paint, dressed in like kind of um, feral versions of 18th century frock coats and things like that and crazy hair. And it's like someone was responsible for coming up with this look and it's something I'd never even thought about before. And also you know, seeing the people maintaining the costumes, uh, I had to go to fittings. It was just, and just the, the rehearsal process, the, the, this sort of gypsy band of people that were interested in, in telling these big stories, I, I, I was just totally bitten, yeah, changed so my you life. So you were on the stage, but you were, you were kind of drawn perhaps to more, more how, yeah. how that stage picture is exactly. kind of put together. Mm -hmm. I'm very much a, I say, a behind the camera guy, not a in front of the camera guy. So there was no, ever, no, no thought of me um, wanting to be on the stage. That was like, I had to get that out of my system and then it took me into the backstage world. After that sort of experience, did you, were you sort of gravitating towards kind of, kind of theatre, kind of, the, kind of the creative arts? Where did you yeah. kind of train in Australia? Started working as a dresser, like, uh, at, the, at the Opera House. Uh, and I thought that maybe perhaps I wanted to be an architect. And so I did a year of architecture, which was incredible. It really taught me how to draw and it taught me a lot about um, history and all that sort of stuff and how to see, see. It opened my eyes to seeing things. But I was pretty sure that I really wanted to work in, in the theatre. I did a three-year course um, at a place called NIDA, which is kind of the equivalent of RADA here. It's like the National Institute of Dramatic Arts. Loved it. It was mostly theatre design, actually, and mostly set design, in fact. And at the end, there was like a little film unit, quite a lot of costumes. But the amazing thing about that course was that it really taught you how to do everything. And I maintain that that's really important for anyone, um, you know, heads of department. They have to know what everyone in their team does. and so. There I was, you know, the age of 21, um, learning how to do scenic art, painting, dye fabric, any colour, make the costumes, um, like very basic drafting and pattern making, um, hair and makeup. I would learn how to light shows, you know, very basic. But of course, just knowing what everyone does, it gives you such a great appreciation of the whole collaboration because that's that's what we are. We're collaborators. We don't work in a vacuum. We work amongst other creative souls. So how did you meet Baz Luhrmann and 
get involved with these two quite quite extraordinary films, they Romeo were. and Juliet, Moulin Rouge, yeah. which, and you know, Baz Luhrmann at that point kind of reinvigorated the Australian film industry yeah. through his work and his, with his partner, Absolutely. Catherine Martin. Catherine Martin, who's a genius uh, production and costume yeah. designer. Yes. Um, yeah, was it, this, so now we're in the 1990s. It was a very <laughs> exciting time in Australian cinema. Uh, there was the Baz Luhrmann films coming out. There was um, Strictly, Bo oh, Strictly Ballroom. Yes, yeah, There yeah, was Priscilla. Yeah. There was Muriel's Wedding. It was yes. like, and all of these films have such a sort of over-the-top, quite theatrical, you know, charm to them. Uh, and so there was kind of like an apprenticeship system. When you graduated from NIDA, um, Baz and Catherine would sort of scoop up their favourite people and um, into their wonderful, they, they rented a big house in Sydney, like an old Victorian house, and they took over the whole building. So it was this wonderful creative hub and there was the set designers on this floor and the costume team on that floor. And we all had um, lunch together and stuff and Nicole Kidman would stop by for a fitting and um, we were, I found myself like waltzing with her one day because she needed to work out how her petticoats and, and the corset would work. It was really, a, really a fun time. So um, yes, they would scoop up these young graduates and you know, my job on Moulin Rouge, I was there for six months before they even started building anything. I was there putting all the research boards together, doing some pr preliminary designs to sort of start sketching out the world. Oh yes, here we go. It was, we had to pitch it to Fox, we had to sort of sell the world that this was a great idea. So I was there to help sort of um, show what it really was. And then of course they did this incredible stylization and brought it right into the 20th century. Um, so yeah, I was there from, for six, six months. And then, but I, I pretty much knew at that stage that I, I wanted to be a, a, cost, a costume designer myself. And it was, it was amazing and it was an incredible creative place to learn, to learn. Um, so much, and they were very generous, but I thought, you know what, this is great, but I think I want to um, try it out myself and do my own costume designing. And these films were absolutely international, global hits. Mm. And I have to say, Moulin Rouge is the only film, the only, my only cinema experience where people applauded during the film. <gasps> Seriously? I've been, I've been in auditoriums <laughs> where people have applauded at the end, uh -huh. kind of Star Wars, things like that. Yeah. People were applauding the musical numbers wow. here in London. Yeah. When, when, when that film came out. I mean, that was yeah. quite an extraordinary, almost an immersive experience. I find it a very generous film. It gives you so much. It's so imaginative and high energy, and it's not for everyone, but I feel like it's, he's really, it's really quite innovative. I mean, he's got, how many filmmakers can you say, that's a Baz Luhrmann film, or that's a that person? It's like, he has his own flavor. People like it, people don't like it, but I think it has a whole lot of imagination and energy. A kind of a wonderful moment that you were kind of kind of part of that world and that and that yeah, team and incredible. Is it the best apprenticeship I could uh, <laughs> <laughs> hope for? And then it was handed over to um, the the people who ended up being the assistant costume designers uh, and the illustrators on the on the film. So it was mostly um, Catherine Martin uh, be, doing the head costume design, but there was a team of illustrators and costumers that would then make all the costumes with, with a huge cast. Huge cast. I mean, I mean it was the biggest film cast I think of people, at that stage ever made in Australia. Oh, really? Yeah, really? It, was a really it was a really big deal. Gosh. The Sydney Olympics. Because <laughs> so, suddenly the world spotlight is on Sydney. Mm. Um, the year 2000. Yeah, year 2000. Yeah. And you become involved with that. Well, it's an interesting journey, actually, because <laughs> I, so I graduated in 1993 and then mostly did theatre and dance and ballet and opera and live performance and then I did my first feature film I think in 1996 and that was all lots of fun but I met um, I met two people who have been quite influential in my life uh, an incredible production designer called Brian Thompson and an incredible director called Jim Sharman who is uh, he directed the the original Rocky Horror um, Picture Show um, film. And they became mentors and sort of put me in front of various eyes. And um, lo and behold, I was offered a job at the age of 29 or so um, to design some costumes for the closing ceremony of the Olympics. So they had lots of different designers. Um, my, my segments were Carly Minogue, uh, <laughs> Elle McPherson. I can't so quite major. Oh, uh, <laughs> and an opera singer who sang the national anthem. So yeah, we all had our um, things. So yes, Carly started out, her first costume was like a little 50s beach out, outfit with like a Hawaiian print on it. And then she sort of appeared at the end as a, uh, as a mega um, um, entertainer. Was this the Dancing Queen moment? This was, yes, this was, this it all comes back to Abba in Australia, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> yes, this was, uh, 
this was dancing queen in, indeed. So that was so a, an, ex fun. an extraordinary, you know, experience with again with the kind of the eyes of the world. With the Olympics, people may not be that into the sport, but people always watch oh, yeah. the opening closing <laughs> ceremonies. The spectacle of it all, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. It serves as a bit of a. Um, it's a kind of a reflection, I guess, of a you know of a nation's cultural heritage and how they want to be seen by the world. So yeah, it was interesting, and it was because it was sort of interesting thinking about what what Australia might mean and who are our icons and all that sort of thing. It was, yeah, it was a really uh, interesting design Fantastic. gig. Um, before, actually, before we get to this period, I wanted to ask you um, really about your your working uh, process um, and. In the kind of in, in the filmmaking process, what usually happens first? Does do you get, re receive a script, or do you you know do you get to know a director, a producer who have an idea, mm -hmm. or do you hear of something that's happening? You think, oh, that sounds like a <laughs> like an interesting project. That's for me. Or is it a mixture of all those things? It's a bit of a mixture of all things. You know, sometimes my agent will. Um, bring me a script and say, this is, this is coming up, you know, they, they're interested in you, do you want to meet them, check out the script, does it have any appeal? And other times it's a, a director that I, I might have worked with before, or indeed a producer or um, something that like gives me a call, I've got this thing coming up, um, does it appeal, is it interested to you? So, but I, I, try to, I try to choose my jobs, something that I haven't done before, something that I feel a bit nervous about, something that I'm going to feel that sort of electric charge of like, can I, can I actually carry this off? Uh, I, I don't really love repeating myself. I like to sort of uh, um, explore brave, brave new worlds. Um, and I think that it keeps me um, stimulated as a, as a creative person. And hopefully it keeps my, it also means that my work is growing. It's not, I'm not just sort of doing the same thing year after year. Costume designers are learning all the time. They don't, they don't know everything, and when I think of my first films and the films I'm doing now, you know, there's, there's a learning process. And we'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about the superhero films, but, you know, I did three films that had Superman in them, and, you know, the, from the first to the last, you, it was a real education. When you first begin to uh, look at a script and kind of deconstruct it and look at the character arc, mm. do you, are you a sketcher? Do you, do you draw the characters? Are they in your mind? Because it all begins, you know, with a with a with mm. a written word, and it's it the designer really kind of brings that person mm. from the script, the screenplay to life in three D. It's an yeah. extraordinary kind of process. Mm. So, what what happens yeah. when you're kind of reading a script? I think when I, so when I'm reading a script, I lots of things might come to my mind as I'm reading the words, uh, images, and influence, and I make little notes to myself like, oh. Um, I don't know, it might be like um, Art Nouveau, or it might be um, Kurosawa, or just random things that I think I really want to, things that just sort of, you know, tickle my fancy. But I, I don't really, I don't start sketching straight away. I mean, a sketch for me is, um, it comes later. It's like, okay, the, the designs are finalized, this is what I think it's going to look like. You show it to the workroom, you show it to the actors, you show it to the directors. But for me, I start, I just cast a net very, very wide. I might look at um, video games, I might look at ancient sculptures, I might go to the British Museum, I might look through my art book. I follow fashion and I'm interested in what fashion designers are doing around the world. Um, so, and I think that I just, I just gather gather things like a, like a hunter and I put them all up on the wall and I, I purposely keep it very, um, you know, I don't overthink it. It's just very intuitive. Um, and then that's usually a trigger and then some things stick and some don't and then I take some things away. I guess I'm very visual. I don't, I don't really write or draw. It's just all of the, my images. And then at that stage I might in, uh, invite a director in and sort of say, I'm thinking, this is the sort of the palette and the, in, the influences and the references that I'm interested in. And then, then pretty soon after that, I, I would normally start sketching. Um, but I, I, I have to also say um, the unsung hero of the costume department is the costume illustrator because mm. I, just because you might be an interesting designer of costumes doesn't mean you're a great drawing and more and more drawer. And more and more these days, you know, the drawings have to be quite wonderful to pitch to a to a studio or to, a, uh, to try and get, you know, the funding for a film, here's what your superhero is going to look like, all that sort of thing. So, you know, there's a wonderful world of incredible um, 
illustrators that, that really help, help things change. Uh, and do you tend to use the same group of artists to help I have visualize. a couple of favourites that I, yeah. I love that we're really on, this, on the same yeah. team. I do, I love sketching myself and sometimes like the Seberg illustrations, they're all me and it just feels sort of, a, it's very personal, I've got this, but if it's something that's extremely technical or complicated or I have to I have a 247 characters and they all have five changes. I can't do that all myself. <laughs> so that's when I bring in my friends. <laughs> Where does um, the production designer the, or the art director fit into this kind of, into this kind of process? Mm. How early do you sort of meet, meet them? Yeah. Um, and you're, you're working with uh, Luke, Luke Hull, Hull yeah. at, at the moment on, on yeah. Andor. Mm -hmm. cool. that, that must be a key, and, and also mm. cinematography as well. That must Absolutely. be a, Those are kind of the key yeah. visualizers. As I touched on before, it's like the world that I work in, it's all about collaboration. You can't possibly do it yourself, and the, the, the skills of all the different departments just help to, to build it, to hopefully make it an incredible product. And it's so important that you're all on the same page uh, creatively. So um, you have to be quite a good communicator, I think, to be a costume designer. You have to be able to express your ideas. You can't just, you can't just let the images um, do the talking. You have to actually get out there in a room and in meetings and talk about your, your vision and your ideas. But yeah, the, the, I, I like to meet the production designer as soon as possible uh, when I'm starting a project because it's palette, it's textures, it's color, it's references, it's, it's what's, what's the story that we want to tell, how are we going to do that, um, what's important to us. Yeah, and Luke Hull that I'm working with at the moment, genius. I mean, five years time, he's going to have an Oscar. He's just so super talented. Uh, so he's creating all these incredible Star Wars sets. Um, and so he has a war room with all of his artwork. Uh, we call it the war room. Uh, <laughs> secret room. I call mine the panic room because there were no win windows in my, in my costume <laughs> illustration room. And so it's sort of like I could get locked in there and no one would ever find me. Um, but he has a great room and all of the, um, his illustrations are, um, and his team of illustrators' illustrations are on the wall. And it's just like you're walking through like, vignettes and tableau of the of the project and so I bring my illustrations in and we work out you know are they are they talking the same language how are the colors looking together because in something like Star Wars um, it's all about building worlds and so for example um, the one that is I can talk about it because there's four episodes out in the world and or that's just come out. We go to lots of different planets and it's very important that each planet is very defined by its culture and its, its textures. And so we talk, uh, I mean, we, we go deep and we kind of geek out about like what, what materials do these, do these cultures have, of it? what technologies do they have, what are their resources, what's the climate like, what's their history, why do, why do they look the way they do, why does the architecture look the way they, it does. And so, it's really, it's really cool. I mean, my passions are, I love history and like how a culture's artistic output reflects their own aspirations and holds up a mirror to that society. I love all of that. And I also love like human psychology and what makes us tick and why we present ourselves the way we do, the choices we make when we dress ourselves and you know, when we want to hide from the world, when, we wanna, when we're feeling confident, we make certain clothes choices and all that stuff and textures that we're drawn to and I, I love all that stuff so uh, I guess that's that's what costume design is for me. You're making these extraordinary kind of ready-made worlds as you say that have mm. that have lots and lots of lots of history mm. and um, actually something that came up when we were talking to Michelle about Game of Thrones which mm. was kind of in a this never never sort of fantasy land but actually mm. costume anchors us. Totally. The costume tells us immediately who these people are, mm. their status, yeah. who they are in the hierarchy of this world, mm -hmm. a world that we might not really you know, recognise, mm. but costume has to work very hard sometimes, I, yeah. I, I think, but, yeah. and that's what you're doing, I think, with yeah. the, you're right. your it's, kind of world. It is, it is storytelling, isn't it? It's like giving the, the audience subliminal clues. You don't want to beat them over the head, but it's like things that they just kind of are subliminally ab absorbing about the textures, the silhouette, the colours, and what clues that gives into the sort of the inner life of, of a character. Um, I, I love all that stuff, it's what makes me excited. Do you try and um, use the same people that are the, the, the pattern cutters, mm. the, the, the makers, mm. the, the dyers, 
from project to project, or is that not so so easy if you're working internationally? Or it's quite tricky, mm. and yeah. and I kind of I'm, I think I'm just at peace with it because sometimes when you work with new teams, you learn different things and they bring out different things in you, and so that's always keeps things very lively. But inevitably, there are like my cutters are like my. My, my little secret weapon, I have two cutters, a male cutter and a female cutter, Marlon and Rob, and they are so, so clever. They really get um, my, my vision. I can, I can throw them an idea and two days later they're like, oh, I, I've developed, I put this together. What do you think of this? And look at this cool pocket that I discovered. And if we put this seam in the collar, it forms a really great shape. And so they are like golden to me. Um, <laughs> But, uh, and I've been lucky to work with them for like the f last couple of projects. Assistants, assistant costume designers, it's just such a busy time in London. Everyone is like, you finish one thing, someone might finish a bit early and so they start something else, you get out of sync. It's quite, it's quite yeah. tricky. Um, but I, I, as I say, I think you have to be at peace with it. You, you try and um, keep your precious family together and if there's space for newcomers, then bring it on. On the subject of sort of um, sort of collaboration, that brings us to um, to three hundred, and mm. you've had a, a, a really long and incredibly important uh, collaboration with uh, Zack Snyder. Mm. So how did you how did you meet, and how did you get involved with three hundred? Well, that, that's an interesting story. So after after the Olympics, I won a scholarship to travel around the world and meet up with other costume designers. I met I met up with Sandy Powell in uh, <laughs> in um, Italy. She was designing. Um, uh, Gangs of New Gangs York. Gangs of New York, thank you. Uh, and lots of other fascinating people. We got to New York and it was like, this place is amazing and inspiring and crazy. This is my hu husband and I. Um, we, we went around the world and we were like, let's, let's put down some roots in New York. Well, let's just do something crazy. So I, I uh, and it was a time, uh, quite a naive time, I guess, where you could actually just like, um, in the mail, send your portfolio to different agents and things like that. So I did that. And uh, one of them had just seen Moulin Rouge and she was like, that was interesting. Come and, come and meet me. And anyway, she ended up representing me and taking a real um, a risk, I guess, a leap of faith. She said, oh, you've worked with Kim Barrett before. So Kim Barrett's an amazing Australian costume designer. She did um, the costumes for Romeo and Juliet. That's how we met and she now lives in America. She did the Matrix films and lots of other fabulous um, costume design work. And she had just met with Zack Snyder, the director of 300. She couldn't do 300. Zack was desperate for her to do it. Um, and, but she said very generously, but maybe you should meet my friend Michael Wilkinson. So I did meet uh, Zack Snyder. He was just a dream and uh, he gave me a, an, a re really amazing Again, a leap of faith. I hadn't done anything like that before. That wow. he must have seen something. I think I showed him my opera work or something like that. It's like, oh, you can think big. Let's give this a go. Well, this is very operatic. <laughs> it is quite operatic, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> it's on a big scale. Uh -huh. so. Exactly. And I think he knew I was interested in history and all that sort of thing. But I also, I, I liked telling stories in modern, surprising ways. I think, I think a lot of it, good costume desi design is also... There's an element of risk taking. I think that um, the audience can sense that it's like, mm. oh, this is this is different. This is new. This is um, this is a little bit out there, um, and it's something that I try to bring to all all of my projects without bringing too much, without taking the audience out of a film. But I feel like for something like Three Hundred, it's mm. like, let's let's go big. Let's uh, let's try and do something that hasn't <laughs> really been seen before. <laughs> and so there you have it. Two thousand and six. Did you did you look at the because um, it's all it's all based on a on a on a graphic on it a is. graphic novel. Mm -hmm. So th was this a starting point? Did Absolutely. you look at look at that? Yeah. You wanted to obviously you're turning a, a comic mm -hmm. into into th into three D. Yeah. In a way that kind of uh, gave us the key of how to approach this because you know it's based on a, a historical um, episode episode uh, in in um, in ancient um, Greek times. But when you see Frank Miller's um, graphic novel, it's so modern and interesting and cool and, um, and very um, it's audacious. And so it's like, okay, people love this comic book, let's just bring it to life. And so it's actually quite true. When you look at the comic book, we, Zach is a huge fa fan of Frank Miller's. So he, he kind of used them as like tableaus and starting point storyboards for his, for his, um, his vision. But we knew we had to uh, be, 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 be bold. Um, but there's, it was a really interesting design experience for me because um, it was how to take a two-dimensional drawn image, which is extremely 
graphic. It's a graphic novel. And when you're, then you're making it into 3D. And not only that, you're dealing with actors and storytelling and all of that sort of thing, world building. Um, there was lots of new technologies used to, it was all filmed in Montreal in a freezing cold drafty uh, soundstage. <laughs> we had guys running around in their leather speedos and capes and there was like <laughs> snow blowing in the cracks of the, uh, the walls. <laughs> but it was surrounded by a green screen, so it was just like a pile of dirt, green screen, huge battle sequences, um, incredible camera work and stuff like that. So it was, it was I, I, I sort of imagine that must be a huge um, challenge in the, in the modern filmmaking process of you know blue screen or green screen mm. work yes for well for for everyone involved that is something that's going to be added so much sort of later in in the process yes does it sort of affect your work sometimes i work quite a lot with the the visual effects department so it it's not just i mean the first discussion always is always blue screen or green screen because you don't want a green dress against a green screen, all of that stuff, you get that out of the way, but it's, it's, much, it's actually much more nuanced and it's becoming more and more of a, of a very important you know, relationship within the filmmakers of like what's, what's the end up product going to be, what are the backgrounds going to be. Um, uh, for something like Star Wars, it's, they, they have, it takes a year for them to do all the post, post effects. So, yeah. so um, I think, I mean, it's great and I'm, maybe I'll, in 10 years' time, I'll, I'll think, what was I thinking? But for me, um, costumes is like, it's the thing that touches an actor's body. And so it's, uh, from when I, I, I spoke to lots of actors, and, you know, it's very, very important for them to feel the fabrics, to feel the shoes, to inhabit the character, to, to create this new persona. The clothes are so important to them. So ho hopefully... Uh, Clothes and costumes will still still be needed. I've also worked on lots of things where you put people in motion capture suits and they add the uh, the costume on later. But it's, that's usually more of like creaturey augmentation thing that you couldn't possibly achieve in in costumes. Um, but it's a, it's a really it's a fascinating dynamic. The VFX, the costume design, the production design is very much affected by. Um, the visual effects department. So a lot of leather in this. There's a lot of leather. There's a lot of. We, I think we had and thousands chains. and thousands of um, <laughs> yeah. red uh, meters of red linen that was flown in from Lithuania and dyed especially into our colors. But yeah, there was a whole um, world to be explored. Yeah. We had this crazy, fantastical version of Xerxes and the Persian um, world, and so that was that. I mean, that is pretty much a extrapolation of a Frank Miller image from his graphic novel, this outlandish um, vision of Xerxes and, and what that stood for. And then this, all of this would have been added in post-production. Yeah, exactly. We, we created that entire costume, yeah, but yeah. all of the background that you're seeing there um, yeah. would have been added in later. Um, yeah, and they do a lot, they do a thing called crowd replication. So. We didn't dress 300, spoiler alert, we didn't dress 300 Spartans. <laughs> we dressed about 30 Spartans. And then they do a thing called crowd replication and they um, cut and paste and make it look like 300 uh, wow. Spartans. <laughs> Yeah, so that must be incredible when you see the final result. Thinking, yeah. oh, uh, oh, they've added yeah. hundreds of hundreds yeah. of actors. Yes, it's a, it's usually a great surprise. Sometimes <laughs> there's a there's a actually I, I did a film once and they changed the color of a, of one of the person, one of the leading actors' costume. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I remember going go to the screening of it and. I, one of the producers was like, so Michael, we have something to tell you. <laughs> and so they changed it from black to purple or something like that. So it's some incredible what they can do. Yeah. We're in their hands. Yeah. Oh, and these, and these incredible mm. um, sort of masks. Yeah, that was a sort of, um, um, again, a, a strong Frank Miller reference. But yeah. he's, he's also an avid historian, so he uh, yeah. is really interested in um, you know, Persian and Greek sculpture and, and culture and stuff like that. So um, his... His, but this was like a sort of wild, uh, it was a part samurai, yeah. part sort of Greek mask, um, part sort of, um, you know, Middle Eastern elements. So it was this huge sort of fantastical creation. How many did you have to make? How many were made? I think we made about 15 of these guys, oh, the, okay. the immortals. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. Again, on to sort of that transition of co comic, kind of a cult kind of comic Mm. Uh, scenario mm. into again yeah. uh, the, th the 3D world mm -hmm. of bringing these characters to life. Yes. 
<laughs> how was, we start? Yeah, how was that process? I mean, Watchmen was really interesting, and it's another example of um, if you ever look at the graphic novel, it's it's pretty much a storyboard for the film. Zach was a huge fan of the, the graphic novel, um, and so how to take these you know very um, two dimensional um, images and make them into like this very gritty and rich. Um, world, so it's my my first foray into the world of superheroes. But there were superheroes oh. that were kind of supposed to be slightly, mm, kind of almost do it yourself. You know, it had to be like Rosh. They, you know, these people were real people who sort of were yeah. kludging together their um, personas and their alter egos with what resources they had um, at hand. Uh, but then also, you need to sort of do a cool like little amp to make it compelling and cool for audiences. Um, so that yeah, that was my first foray in, into that world, and indeed with someone like the Night Owl, this character in the middle, that was my first. Um, that was the first time I got into this whole thing where an actor is scanned, uh, digitally scanned. You make a, a life-size mannequin of that of that actor, oh. and then we sculpted in clay his costume over this mannequin, um, and then we made molds of this sculpture made foam latex like negative or positives from the molds and uh, that's how that costume was put together so it was like mind-blowing for someone who was used to like you know pushing things through sewing machines this was like really it really um, appealed to me I mean I've always been involved in um, sculptures but it tends to be more like armor and hard pieces and stuff but an entire costume head to toe sculpted amazing and we worked with this using in this was um, made in Los Angeles and there's incredible um, workrooms there that specialize in specialty costumes and they have been doing everything since the you know the first Batman films in the, the 19 early 1990s oh, and this, this was made at a place called Ironhead and that's an incredible workshop of um, people incredible sculptors they're always on the cutting edge of new materials that might come in and you'd go in and it's like look at this cool new you know adhesive that I found. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's great. <laughs> what can you do with it? But they're always, they have great suggestions of materials and things to, even his cape, that was like, we had a huge mold that was on the ground and with like a wall around it. And they literally poured latex on the ground in the, in the shape of the cape, let it dry, and, you know, a week later, pulled it up and it became Gosh. His cape, it was, but it had like fantastic specific sculpted lines and things through it. It's all, it's fascinating. So I sort of feel at this stage you're becoming an expert at, well, always an expert on sort of texture and, and sort of fabric, but the kind of the layers of, of sort of armour mm. and, yeah, ha how you kind of piece these kind of people to kind of gather and mm -hmm. thinking about sort of colour and, you know, all of that sort of process. I think but it's something maybe you and I share. I've, like, I've always been interested in um, how like fab or costume making mm. technologies mm. have influenced costumes over the yeah. over the over the ages. So when you look at how costumes were made for the 1930s films, 1960s films, films of today, you know, there's all sorts of new technologies and techniques and fabrics and uh, that inform how the costumes, why the costumes look the way they, they did. The Tin Man from, you know, The Wizard of Oz versus uh, Captain Marvel and things like that. So it's really interesting to sort of think, think about that from a historical point of view. And so I'm, I always try to be a part of that story and explore new materials, see what's out there, um, do things that couldn't have been done five years ago, ten years ago. It has to be appropriate to the, the, the project, of course, if you're doing a lovely, um, you know, 1890s film, uh, it might not be appropriate, but, but for these big sort of superhero things and science fiction and stuff, I, I like to try and um, keep abreast of new developments. And you're also in this um, era of 3D cinema, yes. where we're all putting on our 3D glasses. Exactly. Um, do you, would you know that from the very beginning of the, of the kind of the design process, that this mm. film will be shot and screened in 3D? And that, Sometimes that, a film is filmed regularly and then there's a process that you can make oh, it's it 3D. converted. And other, from the other ones are 3D from the start. But to be honest, I was thinking about it. I, I don't think it, I don't know if it really affects the way I design. I mean, I like to, when you're designing for film, you have to design like 
any square inch of your costume from head to toe might get a close up. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I think. It's, it might be the sole of the shoe. It might be this weird, you know, cuff or something that you hadn't given a lot of thought of. But anything can be in a close up. And so I feel that, um, you know, when you're designing for 3D, that's of course uh, it's not not only close up, but it might be on a screen, and it might be you know fifty meters <laughs> in a, a nightmare. The, the cufflink might <laughs> the cufflink might be fifty meters wide. Yeah. Um, so I think you just have to bring that care and attention to detail, no matter if it's three D or not. Yeah, into a project such as well, we sort of touched on this kind of mm. Tron Legacy, where again it's it's made in made in three D, screened in three D. Mm. And the kind of the, the, the layers of, of the lighting and cinematography and mm -hmm. LED lighting formed so much part yeah. of, of those characters' costumes. In, although they, they, mm -hmm. they have a the very sort of streamlined, that's kind of complex elements to fuse together. Yeah. It was interesting because the director, Joe Kosinski, he really wanted the costumes to actually light up in on camera. So what you're seeing there is not a post-production thing. The, cost, the costume actually looked like that when we were was shooting it. And I think he wanted that because he, he wanted the actors to sort of feel and be informed by, you know, the fact that the, the costumes lit up and he, what, he thought he would get a more sort of organic, um, rich performance um, by having them, it all happen in camera. I mean, of course, there were post-production tweaks and things to make it look um, absolutely perfect. But it was, and that was like, again, I was like, I've never done that before. I've, I'm going to learn about, you know, wiring and battery packs and all that sort of thing. <laughs> and like, because we, we would sculpt these, make these sculpted elements, but we would have to actually scoop, like m make spaces within the sculpture for wiring and for batteries and all, and all that sort of thing. And think about keeping the electricity away from the body of the actor and, the various membranes of the costumes that they, the layers of the costumes that they had to wear. So, again, like I'd never done anything like that before. So it was really, really interesting. So complex for the actors when yeah. they're, when they're getting, you know, dressed in in, in the totally. in the fitting room and going onto the set. Yeah, and, um, and not the most comfortable experience you're going to have. <laughs> and they really they really enjoyed taking the costumes off at the end of the day. I think <laughs> a bit like wearing a corset. I guess that feeling of yeah. like. The unhooking at the end of yes. the day. <laughs> did you um, did you watch the first, the original mm. Tron for inspiration? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. That was the first. That was the starting ah. point because there was so much about that um, that the director loved, and he wanted to sort of update, but also sort of there's a nostalgia I think to the look that is a little bit 1981 mm. I think when the first um, film was made. Um, that um, you know, getting that sweet spot of like. Moving to the future, but also a nod to the, our um, our childhood memories of when the when Tron the first Tron came out and blew our minds. <laughs> this uh, was actually my first uh, experience oh, sorry, with um, with, back, with uh, <clears throat> another technical in innovation yeah. is called Z brush or Z brush oh, yes. as they call yeah. it. Uh, yeah. um, and this is an incredible drawing application where um, so what you're seeing there would be like a they would draw it in a computer as a three dimensional um, object that you can. Um, you can zero in on, zero out, you can apply textures to it. So they, they scanned um, Gareth's body, they put it into the computer and they built this costume in, in 3D in the, in the computer and then used that information to make 3D prints of all of the, they split it up into all different parts, thought about how it would go together and where you'd have to have movement and all that sort of thing. Um, then they would print it out all the different parts through, with a 3D printer, made molds of it, and then made the costume. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> How long was that filming process for a project like that? Um, the prep was yeah, long. The pr Making the costumes was, yeah. took a really long time, and they gave us enough time to, um, to really do lots of R&D on it and get it right. Uh, who, who knew things like when you, you think you're being so exact because it's built on the costume, but when you make things out of foam latex, which most of these things are, because it's sort of, it looks hard, but it's actually kind of soft and flexible. Um, the latex shrinks by like 7% or something like that in the mold. So we discovered that quite late in the process. So everything was, we were like, wait, why is everything so small? And so that everything then had to be enlarged by 7%. And so to take into account the shrinking of the latex. And so it was, uh, it was, it was tricky, I have to say. 
for endlessly solving problems. Oh yeah. Kind of problems that you didn't even know existed. Existed, exactly. <laughs> it's a whole new type of <laughs> Brings us to sort of um, Man of Steel. I, I always like to mm. think that Superman somehow gets invented, uh, well, not invented, reimagined, reimagined for, for every, every generation yeah. somehow. Um, and so you, you're working with uh, Zach again mm -hmm. on, uh, on the kind of the, the new visualization of, of Superman. Mm -hmm. And so it feels like it's a Superman that serves that, that era. Mm. I feel that the, the volume metaphorically has been turned down slightly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Did you, had you seen the 70s, the Christopher Reeve super, Superman films? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So when you approach a project like this, we all we can somehow all picture Superman in our minds. Mm. Was it hard to kind of kind of almost divorce that from you thinking, right? This is a this is a new a new version of it. It's mm -hmm. Zack Snyder's version of it. Yep. It's a new actor. Yep. Gosh, how can I how can I approach this in a fresh way? I suppose. Yeah. I think it goes back to my interest in in fashion and costume. The the fact that when you think of how Superman's been portrayed over the decades, it really is a mirror on society. You know what we thought a superhero was in the fifties when when mm -hmm. Superman um, first graced the the, the small screen, um, the sixties, the seventies. Every every generation, uh, you our hopes, our aspirations, what we think is important, what we think are heroic godlike figure is, is sort of reflected in the, in the Superman costume. And so I feel like when Zach and I were talking about it, it's like, well, this, these, are, these are complex times. It's not the 1950s. There's all sorts of forces uh, at, at, uh, around in society. And, you know, slightly maybe a, uh, we, we thought we should reflect that in, in the costume. And so the colors are definitely um, not only muted, but they kind of have a metallic quality to them, kind of like a... Um, a Kryptonian, if you will, uh, a metal that would, um, from his um, home planet, we thought it has a sort of chainmail texture through it um, that we kind of liked a sort of um, science fiction version of that, feeling like it is his his armor. And again, we just thought about every square inch. We thought about the soles of the sh of the feet because when he's flying, you're going to see them. Uh, a lot of these pieces were drawn in the computer and printed and became um, applied to the the final costume. But yeah, we definitely thought about the tone of the film. And it's funny, even looking at it now, um, you know, if I feel like you'd almost design a different Superman no matter what period you, you were in. Maybe in 2022 you'd design Superman differently, but I feel like that sort of was a little, um, you know, a little sort of capture of, of the mood of 2012? Mm, 20, yeah, 20, yeah. Yeah, 2012. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and of course you have, you know, you not only you get Superman, but you get, you know, Lois Lane, yep. Lex Luthor, you know, you get all, <laughs> all the you, icons. You get all these kind of iconic characters. Yeah. Um, and you're working with a Amy Adams, and we'll come to Amy Adams a bit later from American Hustle. Yes. You've crossed paths quite a lot with yes, Amy. Yes, Again, yeah. how, did you, how did you think about Lois Lane? How did you think about her character and what Amy was going to bring new to that role? Yeah, I think we, um, we wanted to very much, you know, bring it up, up to date and to um, have Lois Lane as a, um, as a very intelligent, sort of worldly um, character who was sort of forging her own path. I think she's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist in our, in our story. Um, and so she, um, we didn't want her just to be someone who needs rescuing all the time. She's definitely on her own path and she has incredible um, strength. Yeah. We haven't actually touched on um, alter, alter egos yeah. about, you know, all these superheroes have mm. the, you know, the normal sort of kind of persona. Mm. And so I wanted to ask you, yeah, about, yeah. about Clark Kent yeah. it's and, something... and thinking about that character. Yeah, it's something that I'll, I guess comes up a lot with costume design, using clothes to... Um, to create a persona, uh, and it'll, it'll, we'll talk about it a lot with American Hustle because all of those people are like using clothes to be 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 a different person to perhaps who they um, started off being. With um, with superhero films, you often get this you know um, um, this whole whole idea of having a um, an a alter alter ego. So um, and you have to sort of. Um, you have to pause your um, credibility too because it's the whole thing of like, you put the glasses on, oh my gosh, who is this person? It's a whole <laughs> different person. It couldn't possibly be the same person. Um, uh, but, you know, with the, his clothes, we wanted to really, his, um, like his, um, we call them his civilian clothes, his uh, uh, clothes as Clark, 
Bismarck, and we wanted to sort of lean heavily into the sort of American, you know, Midwest sort of archetypes. You know, he sort of grew up uh, on a farm, uh, and he so there was quite a lot of plaid. Uh, we sort of went with that sort of whole casual American um, American wear. So there's like a nice corduroy unstructured jacket. Um, he's got nice sort of combinations of. Um, there's always like a little plaid or a check there, even when he's sort of working at the Daily Planet and he's sort of um, moving up in the world. Um, but yeah, the, and then even like, I think the next slide, we, we wanted to move into leather jackets and things like that. Clark Kent's never really been seen in a leather jacket before, so we um, found a great um, mm. uh, leather jacket for him and yeah, yeah. tried to sort of yeah. think about, again, him as a, as a real character. What would it be like to work on a farm, come to the big metropolis, start working in this, um, in, at the Daily Planet and uh, um, try to sort of make his way there. So. And then you have these kind of quite extraordinary <laughs> uh, kind of Kryptonian characters. Yeah. Huge layers of uh, armour, metal work, mm. uh, and to kind of create that kind of world. Yeah. Um, was, I mean, again, kind of, kind of complex, multi-layered. Yeah. And all, all realised, all costume realised. Yeah. yeah. There was a little... There was a little CG um, supplementation to a lot of these, ah. but um, most of these were yeah made f for to be in front of the camera. I mean, I think our starting point was when we talked about we thought about Krypton, we sort of thought almost like a sort of neo medieval world where you know they had um, they had dynasties. It was quite feudal. They had family crests. You know, the S is actually oh, the crest yeah. of the fa the family that yeah. Superman comes from, yeah. and so I think. You know, in a way, and we thought a lot about yeah, armor and yeah, chainmail yeah, and yeah, that sort of thing. Is, yeah, the is actually there. Yeah, exactly, yeah. sort of this heraldic kind yeah. of world. But also, I I thought a lot about what technologies do they have, and you know, what materials do they use, and to us um, mere earthlings, you know, these technologies and and materials wouldn't be known to us. So I tried to hint at that of these interesting metallics that have kind of a fluid quality to them. You know, the um in in post-production, some of these elements kind of um, moved and shifted through the armor in mysterious ways. So I, I wanted to hint at technologies and materials we weren't quite familiar with. And were these the um, these are the actual uh, colors? Were they were they tweaked in yeah. in post-production? Um, no, we oh. so and Zach's always he loves things like always gritty and sort of um, like there's a life to it. It's been used in a million battles and things. So we did lots and lots of tests of paint tests of distressing and aging and encrusting so um, the mixture of this super high tech unknown technology but the sort of the, the battle torn bludgeoned crusty dirty I like I like those two elements together lots of I think lots of lots of history yeah exactly. um, in these kind of costumes we're sort of segueing into um, dawn of justice Batman vs Superman oh, yeah. so uh, uh, I'm not going to ask you to give anything away, <laughs> but for these, <laughs> for our actors, <laughs> our jobbing actors, yes. going playing these kinds of kind of huge, kind of mythic superhero roles, you know, you get Superman, you're thinking, okay, that's it. Is that a year in the gym? Yeah. Oh my gosh. So without giving anything away, the poor, do the are, are the actors helped in any way to create that those shapes? Yeah, I mean, I, I think. When you sign up for these uh, projects as an actor, I mean, it is a lot of hours in the in the gym, and not only that, like nutritional advice from your trainers and things like that. It's like all respect to them; they put so much work into um, creating the right physiques um, to be these um, characters. But there's something about no matter how hu how huge and defined a human could be, there's something <laughs> mythical and you know almost supernatural about these figures. And I feel and when we're constructing the suits we we take that into account and we and also a lot of the um the tight fabrics are actually quite compressive so often we would get into a fitting and like henry is like oh i thought i was been working so hard but once i'm in this suit it actually like Ooh. it's like wearing you know a compressive suit and things actually get a little smaller so you sort of have to um overcompensate with that pump it up slightly like costume so, yeah. So, somehow yeah uh, so our superheroes are now are now all merging. Mm. It's not just Superman. It's not just Batman. Mm. They're all now in the same. Yeah. They're all merging in the same film, and you get to design Wonder Woman. 
Such a thrill. The first time I remember they were um, auditioning for the role, who's going to be the new Wonder Woman. And so we had a slew of, of fantastic young actresses come in and try on the sort of uh, proto-site suit that I had made for them. Um, and I think we all knew when we met Gail that she was the one. She's a one in a million. Yeah. And she's uh, super serious about you know being the best Wonder Woman that the world's ever seen. And she worked super hard to, to achieve that. Um, but it was great. Um, this is an example of a costume that was, we scanned her, we drew the costume um, in the in the computer. Uh, we wanted to sort of, it, to feel ancient and battle scarred, and so it has lots of, oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It has lots of dings and textures, and um, you know, it refers back to the cuirasses of the Roman armor where the, the musculature is in, in the armor. It's sort of actually sculpted into it. So she has like her own like six pack and fantastic sort of details um, to that. But we, we incorporated these very modern design lines into it. So it was a nice mixture of, of the ancient and the modern. So was it, um, sorry, was it met metallic, her, her sort of her bodice? It's, it's or... actually, um, it's, a, what's, what, it's urethane. Um, ah, yeah, ah. so it's a composite material. Ah. It's slightly flexible, but you're able to, when you put it, and you, before you put the material into the mold, you put this incredible, um, you spray this amazing metallic paint into it. And then when you put the latex in, the polyurethane, sorry, it sticks to the paint. And when you pull it out, it's got this like chromed metallic sort of feel to it. And it's actually too bright. You then have to uh, add layers and layers of paint over it so you can sense the metal coming through. But that's, that's how you achieve this sort of ancient feel to it. Gosh, I'm sensing that you must be the world expert <laughs> on <laughs> creating these kinds of forms for these uh, superhero. Well, yes, I mean, no. I mean, I, as I was saying before, the technology keeps um, yeah ke keeps developing, and so what was new like five years ago is old hat now, and there's a whole and new we're all, yeah, and we're all sort of slew of materials and technology. Um, and, and then uh, another sort of segue into sort of in Justice League and mm -hmm. and kind of kind of more kind of people to kind of you know create from very established kind of comic strip kind yeah. of kind of heroes and um, you, you've been able to kind of you know keep sort of coming up with you, you've been able to sort of stay fresh which is uh, you know well a credit to yourself as a designer to keep you know reinventing it and kind of coming up with something new hmm. I mean personally I love I love having a starting point if if I was asked to design Aquaman and had never been an Aquaman before, I, I might have like that sort of blank canvas syndrome of like, oh my gosh, where do I start? But I love building on things that already have a legacy. You know, when you look at how Aquaman's been drawn for 30 years, you think about that, why it was drawn that way, what does he stand for? It, it's fun having that as a starting point and like, well, what's my take on it? Where, where are we going to go with it? And how does it fit, most importantly, with the story that the director's trying to tell. So it's not just like what looks cool, which I mean what looks cool is also very, um, it's impossible to underestimate how important that is, <laughs> but also um, you know why does it, why does it look that way, what, why, do the, why, why those motives, why those textures, for, like for Jason's um, Aquaman um, costume we actually started with his, the design of his tattoos because um, we see him quite a lot without his armour um, oh. at the beginning of the film. And so we wanted there to be a relationship between the, the tattoos that I designed for his body and his um, the hard armor that he eventually wears. So all sorts of interesting processes. A huge amount of pressure. I, I sort of imagine <laughs> a huge sort of budget, people, mm. I mean, and a, a, a long time frame of, of, of shooting. Yes. Yeah, it's definitely a uh, challenge to your stamina, for one thing. <laughs> you know, these projects yeah. do go on for a long time, and each shooting day is, is super intense. Yeah. So it's a bit of a difference between, like, theatre design, I think. you Theatre design, that first week leading up to yeah. opening night is everything, and you put in your 24-hour yeah. days. But for, for film, you know, I think this was, like, a 250-day shoot or something like that, and okay. so and every day was just as intense as the last. So Gosh. you really have to, like... Uh, pace yourself um, but yeah I mean it's interesting like in these days of like social media and like the dialogue is just open to everyone it's so I mean it's it's fascinating because when you know we were growing up you know there were the film reviews and there was the, the chat but now it's like everyone can post their thoughts about everything so yeah it's it's, it's fun yeah. and it's yeah it's interesting I try not to um, get too caught up with it because I feel like for me I think what pushes me is like, 
it has to be up to the standard that I want it to be. It's like that is my, that's what I aim for. And I know when I've, I know when I could have done better, and I know when it's like you know we just did our very best, and I'm so proud. And so I feel like you, ha you kind of have to do it for yourself. You have to do it for the the filmmaking team. And if you feel like you've done a great job, then that's the important thing. These characters, yeah, have their own huge kind of fan fan mm. base. Yeah. So I imagine, yeah, as, well, you've touched on it, kind of the, the, kind of the, the scrutiny. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's fun to be part of the dialogue. It's fun to like have a person in Brazil sort of say, you know, thank you so much for this. Uh, I really, it made me think about that. And, and it's, it keeps the conversations alive. Um, we're going to go back in time just slightly. Okay. Just to, <laughs> just to yeah. move away from these kind of huge kind of, to kind of just... Yeah, think about sort of uh, Babel just for a moment and mm. to kind of think about, again, a, a, a film, a contemporary film. Mm. Is it easier, and I asked, uh, no right or wrong question, <laughs> but I, I asked Sandy and Michelle this question. Uh -huh. <laughs> is it, is it, inverted commas, is it, is it easier to design a contemporary based uh, film or something that's set in the past or the future? I think or I'm... both all have their own mm. challenges. I, I actually find contemporary film particularly difficult, I have to say, because there's such scrutiny. There's no, you can't hide, there's nowhere to hide is what I always say, you know. With, with period film, you're probably the expert in the room about 12th century armor and like how it was made. But with contemporary clothes, like everyone knows the difference between like a, a five pound Primark t-shirt and a 200 pound Comme de Garçon white t-shirt. You know, you, all of those details, or like a good pair of jeans or a bad pair of jeans. Uh, so all of those details, everyone's an expert, and so it is quite challenging, you know, with the fittings, the approvals, you know, the comments from the partners of the producers. Oh, um, I don't know if that's, you know, is that, mm, that reminds me of what my mother wore to my wedding. It's like you get all these random sort of uh, associations with things. So it's, it's quite challenging, and I really take my hat off to pe costume designers that do interesting contemporary work because it is, it's really hard. It's quite hard to capture the, uh, the um, attention and the imagination of your, of your audience. You notice them if they're wrong, you know, if they're like, oh, I don't really think that character would wear that, you know. But if, they're, if you've done a good job, you sh they should just feel right and then you just are drawn into the story. Yeah, yeah. Um, I absolutely loved your design for, for Seaberg. It's 1968. And it's a yeah a, a particular time and place. Mm. Um, and um, let's tell you what. Let's look at some of your your designs. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, again, you're working again with Kristen Stewart, who mm -hmm. worked with before. I did. Yeah, and is that always kind of lovely when you kind of you cross paths with, 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 with an actor? I think it's great for, for someone like Kristen. Like I met her on the I did the last mm. two Twilight films, and then I worked with her ten years later on this. It's just lovely as creative people to like. Like uh, have like she's come a long way. I've I've got new skills and new experiences. It's just lovely to sort of come together and acknowledge that. Did you watch a lot of Gene Seberg um, movies yes. from, from the period? Which was a get the, get an absolute design. pleasure. She's such an incredible and yeah. under under the radar uh, actress. Yeah, um, yeah. she's really yeah. with an incredibly tragic life. So it was yeah. we really wanted to do a yeah. story justice. And it's a it's a beautifully shot designed. Film, cinematography, production, design, your, your work. Oh, thank it's, you. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's stunning. It really is thank you know, you. well worth yeah, a viewing. Um, and then, into, yeah, let's um, tell you what, let's just go into, oh, Aladdin. So, we're in the, <laughs> and both with Michelle and with Sandy have, have also been in, in the Walt Disney mm -hmm. world. So, I, I, again, you are turning a, a sort of a, a product. Mm. Uh, you know, a, a, an animation into into live action. How do you do that? Are there a lot of, pe <laughs> are there a lot of people to please? <laughs> there, there are lots of uh, lots of voices in the in the room. Um, but I think, I mean, I think Disney really loved Guy Ritchie's work and hit the flavor that he brought to it. They wanted something a bit irreverent and cheeky and mischievous, um, and so we were kind of given license to. Um, to have fun with things, and it's such a delightful um, story. The world that it's set in is so fun, uh, whether it's in a sort of um, gritty marketplace or the, the palaces of, of Agrabah. Um, it was a complete 
delight. You can imagine it for a costume designer to be offered these opportunities. And we actually went to India and Turkey um, to source fabrics and shoes and accessories and all that sort of thing. So it was a real, um, a real pleasure to put, put these looks together. And kind of a break of scene from armor and all that mm. other kind of superhero kind of yeah. world to kind of, yeah. Yeah, definitely. It works something like sort of this. <laughs> you know that when you're designing like a, uh, they call them the, the Disney princesses. You know, there's always yeah. a Disney princess in a Disney film. So with um, Princess Jasmine, she had about seven or eight different looks um, in the um, in the film, and we knew each one sort of had to be quite iconic, iconographic. So we um, put lots of love and intention into all of her uh, costumes, including the one that is, I guess, most famous from the animation, The Whole New World, um, when she's on the flying carpet with the ladder, the turquoise. <laughs> so we did our own interpretation of, of that. But yeah, bringing things from a, a drawn animation into a 3D world, which had to have all sorts of um, richness and details and the whys and wherefores for why things look the way they do had to sort of be explained. So. And, and a, you know, a, a big cast as well. and Huge. Huge, yeah. 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 Dealing with choreography, that was also oh, interesting. Yes. Like oh, yes. Designing yes. for dancing is, is, yes. is a yes. certain skill yeah. too. Now this is so sharp in terms of tailoring, mm -hmm. in terms of characterization, um, and filmed all filmed in London. All filmed in London. All filmed in London. Yep, just around the corner from here. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And how did you sort of piece these characters together? Did you did you shop? Do you shop with your actors? Uh, never. I tried not to shop with the actor. Okay. Uh, <laughs> usually not the best use of time. But I think it's better for me to have a focused and cur curated shop and put things on the rail and to come to them with, uh, with yeah. ideas. But um, that was like, again, Guy Ritchie's characters, larger than life. You can definitely turn up the volume on a lot of these characters. So I sort of enjoyed finding how much I could do that and where the sweet spot is to sort of also make them believable and fun, but um, also, um, yeah, have some fun with, with them. So we had Matthew, Matthew McConaughey, we made all his beautiful um, tailored suits. He had to sort of stand for new money, so he had sort of lots of resources, but maybe not the family and the So they were, all, they were all made? Yeah, they were all made for him. Gosh, yeah. Gosh. So he sort of has less sort of structured, more, uh, we call them Italian suits that don't have all of the gubbins and uh, layers in them. And then someone like Charlie Hunnan was more of a classic English tailoring. So we, yeah, it was kind of fun exploring different types of tailoring, the sort of semiotics of different types of tailoring and what they said about the characters and their backgrounds. So lots of sharp tailing on Michelle Dockery. And then, of course, the track suits. Oh, yeah, now we've got, we've got a good... Oh, <laughs> hang on, hang on. Let, let me just put the track suits. Because, they were um, my... Oh, the track suits. My pride, my pride and joy. Your pride and joy. Yeah. <laughs> that was so much fun coming wow. up with these. Like, so we, we sort of looked at these heritage fabrics, <laughs> you know, hounds tooths and, um, you know, tattersall checks and all, lots of classic sort of English patterns, but we pumped up the colors, pumped up the scale, had them printed on these sort of interesting fabrics and made our, um, yeah, our, uh, our track suits for them, which is, I'm delighted to say, have been copied around the world. And ah. I know if you ever Google like ah. the gentleman track suits, you can find them from like okay. 10 pounds to 700 pounds, okay. so you can okay. take your pick. So there was no sort of, uh, sort of fashion line? Collaboration, I think yeah. that was a missed opportunity there, I must mm. say, next time. Next time. <laughs> Uh, here you are in a galaxy far, far away, Indeed. in this incredible world. Did you, I'm sort of assuming you watched Rogue One, which is part of the expanded sort of Star Wars universe. Indeed. We're sort of pre, it all gets a bit complicated, doesn't it? If people mm -hmm. don't know the narrative, it's kind of pre A New Hope. Exactly. Which is actually episode four. Exactly. <laughs> um, clear as crystal. It's, it's, how, it's, yeah. how, it's how the rebels got hold of the Death Star plans. Exactly. But we're, we're going back again, aren't we? Yes. Cassie so, and Andor's story. So there, are, there are nine films in the whole thing. The famous first one is ch episode four. Rogue One comes just before that. And Andor is the five years leading up to Rogue One. OK. Yeah. Everyone OK with Super that? Super simple. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I mean, the interesting thing was like showing how Diego Luna became the character that he is in Rogue One, in Rogue One. Yeah. and we see him the sort of polar opposite to that in, in our film, he, in our series. He starts off as like a bit of a bumbling, no hoper, he's messing up everything, he owes people money, he has no discipline, uh, he's passionate but he doesn't know how to channel all these emotions, so you kind of see him 
and sort of like hiding in his clothes and being a bit of a bit of a scruffy young man to then we get to show over the two seasons how he becomes this very disciplined and um, focused uh, character that we see in Rogue One. And you're you're working with um, Genevieve O'Reilly. Mm, yes. Yeah. She plays Mon Mothma, who's a yes. fan favorite. She's a character that has appeared in lots in, of different yeah, episodes. In, in, yeah. Played um, by different. By different actresses. Different actors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and but so she's having her own moment, isn't she? She's having her own moment. Yes, I know. Good. And she's only been sort of hinted at. Mm. Uh, in but but in our show, we see her in a very detailed character arc, going from um, a very privileged um, senator on Coruscant to a um, a rogue rebel um, run, runaway senator that starts to lead the rebellion. So, so that's going to be a very interesting arc for her. For, for her, her costumes. Character. Uh, for her costume. Exactly. Of course, Stay of tuned. Yeah. Um, and you very kindly sent me some uh, screenshots the other day of um, yeah, the, kind of, the kind of worlds that you're, again, we've touched on that, mm. kind of these kind of extraordinary, you know, ready-made worlds that we kind of, you know, have to sort of step into. Um, you know, it's all unknown to us. Yes. Um, but they have to be, uh, yeah, kind of created. Yeah. And uh, how, again, how much of this is, is it a lot of green screen work? How much of this yeah, is a lot of set extensions, lots yeah. of digital. Yeah. Um, we, so we, but um, the difference between Andor and the other um, Star Wars series that are being made in the states is that we do not use the volume. The volume is this amazing technology where it's basically an entire soundstage is the backdrop <laughs> is a screen, and you can project pre-prepared scenery onto the screen, uh, and then as the camera moves, this whole backdrop moves, it's really quite elaborate. But our filmmakers weren't really interested in that technology. They really wanted it to feel as gritty, as real, as grounded, as dirty, as messed up as possible, which is something that's quite hard to achieve on the volume. So we went to lots of different locations. We, we, didn't, we only used blues and green screens. We didn't use projected scenery at all. Uh -huh. um, so I think the, the, the product feels, it feels very real for a, for a sci-fi series. I feel like you can it's, you can smell the scenery, you can feel the textures, you can, it all feels quite um, authentic and yeah. well yeah. thought out. So. Yeah. And yeah, huge layers of ar armour representing the empire. Mm. But um, you, you, again, you're, 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 moving, you're, you're moving away and from the things that we might think we might see. Mm. But these kind of wonderful sort of added added touches, I, I, I feel, mm. you know, the armoury that's taking place. Also with Star Wars, it's... There's the nostalgia element too, right? It was yeah. created in the 70s, and so everything always sort of ties back to this sort of retro vision of the future. But I always say that the success of the Star Wars costumes uh, throughout the Star Wars films is that I feel that they're always grounded in in something from our world, whether you think of like, even if you think of the most outrageous costumes that Queen Amidala wore, they're like, there's Mongolian references, yeah, there's yes. lots of Middle Eastern references, it's all kind of mashed yeah, yeah. together. Yeah. You know, Tatooine, yeah. the desert planet, there's sort of Moroccan things there. So there's always something there. It's not so like, whoa, I can't even relate to this costume. I don't even know how to process these textures. There's something, there's a way in that sort of has some sort of subliminal resonance, uh, I think, with the, with the audience. And I think that's, it's different to the other science fiction franchises. I think it really helps um, Star Wars have a heart. And I think, uh, I've mentioned this before, that costume has to sort of gr ground you. Mm. Uh, it has to, you have to sort of be able to relate to it. You do. Even if the... You can't relate to the world. You think, where, mm -hmm. you know, where are we? Suddenly, we're on a, yeah. on a, on a, you know, on a spaceship, and we're landing somewhere. Mm -hmm. Where, where are we? Yeah. But the, but the costume, we, we think, ah, mm -hmm. we know who this is. Yeah. And we know maybe sometimes which side they're on. Exactly. And what the climate's like. What the climate? Yeah. All those, mm -hmm. all those kind of clues about about who they are. So you're immersed in <laughs> series two. I am shooting very soon. This brings us to your. Oscar and BAFTA nominated costumes for uh, American Hustle, uh, which is just a visual treat. Well, it's a treat on every, on, in, in performance, in sort of costume design, production design, um, and bringing all these, all these, 
it, this is like a, a kind of an all-star cast yeah. in in that great kind of cast. Hollywood tradition yeah. of bringing all these people into kind of one kind of project. Incredible. At this point, you're you're working with Amy Adams quite quite a lot. Yes. Yeah. It must be. Is that always kind of yeah. good when you think, ah, oh, she's playing this role? It's fantastic. Whenever she walks yeah. through the door, I'm always so pleased to see her. Yeah. And she is a real. I I find her like a what I call like an old school actress. She the the fitting always starts with a chat. You don't just like reach for like, oh, this looks cool, or I'd look great, great in that. It's always like, what are we, what are we trying to say here? You know, what, what? Are, let's talk about the character, and which is so great, great for me because it really gives me clues about finding solutions. And she's like the, she's the ultimate. Like she, she wore some outlandish things uh, in this from her starting out as like a sort of Let small, me. small town yeah, um, girl, gonna... moved to New York and sort of. Um, Built this incredible persona yeah, for yeah, herself. Yeah, that's, that's, um, yeah, yeah. And so she's really, all of the characters, as I was saying before, in American Hustle are using clothes to create these kind of personas of who they want to be, who they feel they should be, who they need to be to get to where, where they, yeah. what they've charted out for themselves. And so it's, it's not disguise, but it's very much, it's a very considered, these, these very considered like clothing choices. And so Amy starts as like girl from small town, super smart, but too smart for the, her town, moves to New York, has a plan, and um, uses clothing and mystique and um, grooming to sort of like, to take her on the adventure that she, she wants to be. Um, and so, and Amy, you know, she'd try on some like horrible double polyester suit and she's like, this makes me walk this weird way. And then she would try this chiffon like Halston, you know, dress that's like absolute nothing, slip that on and it's like, oh, well, that makes me walk in this way. And I feel like I need these shoes and like I can, this character. And so it was very much this sort of playtime, how do the costumes make me feel? And yeah, it was really an incredible journey. How much was made and how much did you use late, mid-70s vintage pieces to piece together the, mm. whole, the whole film? I, I always wanted to tread the sweet spot of like having enough authentic pieces from the period in there that's like it feels completely, yes, I'm watching something from 1978. But inevitably, you, you, you get the piece from the Holston archive and it's like got a bit of a hole in it or a stain or it's not quite the right color or it's like doesn't it's the wrong size and so we did have access to all these incredible clothes from Hol Hol I made a contact at Halston I introduced myself to Diane von Furstenberg uh, went through her archives she was a big fan of Amy's um, so and found all these great we just sort of scoured the whole country for dealers that um, specialized in these um, these pieces and we'd either go to them or they would send us pieces. Um, but then at the end of the day, it's like, you know what, this just this evening dress is just in the wrong size and we need it to be white, not purple. So let's just make it. Um, or um, David Russell, the director, has a specific vision. Um, it needs to be, I, well, I can't find exa anything exactly like that. Let's just make it. Um, yeah, so my, my, I was trying to use as much as po authentic as possible, but then inevitably a lot of things were, were made, especially the men's suiting that all had to be fit like a dream and feel str um, fresh and new. So, uh, Amy has a lot of costume changes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do do you remember like how 42 many? 42 or something like that. I how think? many? 42. 42. Okay, so yeah. when we're watching it, we can... Yeah, you can <laughs> take them off. Yeah, you can take them off. Lots um, of montages. Yeah. Did you, um, to immerse yourself in 1978... Did you did you watch TV from that era? Films? Oh uh, yeah, I mean, uh, anything magazines. I could get my hold on, especially films. But what I love about David o. Russell's vision, and I think what makes it such a fresh film, is that he is interested in like the messiness of people's lives. You know, he didn't want us to reproduce fashion shoots or see catalogues. He wanted us to like. He he encouraged me to look at lots of like people's family albums of like their bar mitzvahs and their like, you know, coming out into society or their first day at school, like real slice of life stuff. And I think it really helped inform the characters have those unexpected surprises and weird, the weird way that people put clothes together that makes them hopefully feel a bit more real and less, um, you know, um, propaganda, fashion images of how people should look. It was more, more messy. I love yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> it was a ginormous hit. <laughs> yeah. It was I mean it's been it was called a modern classic as soon as it as soon as it came out. And it really keeps you on your toes. Mm. 
got to pay. I won't give anything there. else away because mm -hmm. we're about to watch it. Yeah. But it really, it's, it's pacey, it keeps you on the toes, that the dialogue is sort of scintillating, yeah. kind of drawing from almost 30s and 40s, yeah, almost, kind of, almost kind, of screw, kind of screwball mm -hmm. comedy, yeah. slightly sort of darker, I think. Mm -hmm. But that kind of period, I think, is sort of captured, 1978 is captured so, yeah. so brilliantly. It yeah, really I, is. I thought in, a lot about like, you know, 78 was a very particular flavor. It was before, it was like pre-gym, so everyone was just like letting it all hang out. No one yeah. had to be perfect. It was before the sort of 80s streamlined, sculptural, tailored craziness. So it was this amazing little explosion where I feel like it was like the cult of the individual and expressing yourself in your clothes, in, a, in your own way. You weren't like, uh, you, don't, you have to look like this or you have to look like that. I feel like people have this really fresh, exploratory way of, you know, yeah, expressing and themselves in clothes. The clothes are so sexy. <laughs> I mean, they absolutely ooze sex appeal. Well, like I had a great, <laughs> I had a great looking cast. I, uh, they, without them, it would just be piles of fabric on the floor. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and they were also brave. I mean, I know you hear that a lot, how brave the actors were, but they, they just left, they checked their ego at the door and they were like, this thing looks crazy on me, or this isn't very flattering, but this is definitely what this character would wear, and they just, like, they were fearless, and it was, I think you can really, you get that electricity yeah. on screen, where it's like, people are just like... But they're empowering. Exactly. I think they're really, the clothes, the costume, is, it's really, really empowering yeah. for these people, that yes. kind of, it's about show. Yeah. It's about mm -hmm. a, a, a character, almost becoming a character. Yeah. I think my favorite, my favorite scene is the scene in the, um, in the dry cleaners yes. when uh, Christian yeah. Bales is like, try anything on you want. And she's like trying on these like designer clothes for the very first time. It's like, whoa, you know, this yeah. is not what a Sears polyester jumpsuit feels like. <laughs> it was like it was, you can really feel that she's getting a clue about the power of clothes and how they can change mm. how people feel about you. Which is one of your favorite films with regard to costumes? Uh, that, uh, that someone else has designed? Yeah. Oh, that's a great Ooh, question. That's a good question. You know, I'm glad you asked it because it gives me a, a chance to give a shout out to my all-time favorite costume designer. It's a man called Piero Tosi, T-O-S-I, uh, an Italian guy who worked with um, Zeffirelli, all the greats, Zeffirelli, Visconti, Fellini. I mean, his work is uh -huh. incredible. Uh, and uh, people like um, Milena Cannonero, I think, uh, who is, designs all Wes Anderson films, was a, a sort of a, a student of his. Anyway, Piero Tosi, most brilliant person, and I, I was given a book on him as a, I, I think at the age of 25 from this director, Jim Sharman, I was telling you about, and he was like, check this out, and it just blew my mind. The, it, it was the first time I saw costumes as a, the truly, the possibilities, the truly expressive nature of clothes, how the subtleties, he would design high, low, peasants, um, you know, he designed a lot for Sophie Loren and all of those greats, but he brought such imagination and artistry to, to what he did. So I think of his films, my favorite is probably Death in Venice. Um, so I think you're one of Australia's greatest cultural exports. <laughs> um, That's you very have kind. worked on some of the most extraordinary projects over the last sort of 20 years. And you still found time to come and talk to us today, which has wow. been such a pleasure and such a delight. So, ladies and gentlemen, would you please put your hands together for the wonderful mm -hmm. Michael Wilkinson. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lovely to meet you all.